Hello, chefs. This is Chef's PSA Podcast. I'm your host, Andre Natera. On today's episode, we're going to get into kitchen etiquette. Stay tuned. Before we get into it, let me tell you what I've been up to. So here are a couple of things that you need to know. First and foremost, I've been translating these books that I've written into Italian and the one that I'm currently working on, Bad Sue, Good Chef, will be out within one week. So if you're looking for it in Italian by Saturday, September 9th, it should be available in Italy. Actually, I think it's also available in the rest of the world, but specifically this is for the Italian market. I have a sale going on right now through September 8th at the Chef's PSA merchandise store. So the hoodies, the beanies, the caps. Can't get this hat, but I have another one that's Happy Cook. Close. You can get that one. Everything... On sale right now, you can take 10% off using the promo code HAPPY. I'll put a link in the show notes. Lastly, exclusive to YouTube, I just put out episode one of how to manage like an executive chef. So this is a series that I had recorded during the pandemic. It's in the style of masterclass and it's, you've seen clips of it most likely on social media where it's me in a looking, looking debonair in a business suit, talking to the camera about food costs and leadership fundamentals and things like that that class. People always ask me, where is this from? Where's this from? Well, I'll tell you what I've done is I'm going to put all those episodes from that class only on YouTube. The first one is out. So go to subscribe on the YouTube channel and you can see all the classes. I will release them as I polish them up a little bit and get them ready for the platform. So episode one is available. Go to YouTube, hit the subscribe button there and make sure you follow Chef's PSA. Last update. I started working on the food cost companion to the three-part food cost series. So the guide that I said I would give away a free ebook. I just finished the content for it. Now I got to polish it up and make it look pretty. So, I mean, realistically, I could get it done in a couple of days, but I got a lot of other things going on. So let's say within two weeks or to one week, it'll be out. Hopefully I'm announcing it that it's available by this time next week when you're listening to the next podcast. But anyway, regardless, yes, it's done. It's written. I just need to polish it up. That'll be available on Gumroad and I'll make sure I link it when it is available. I was in San Antonio this past week doing a leadership seminar and talking to a lot of chefs this week. So I've been talking to chefs all over Texas, the Illuminati chefs, right? So the movers and shakers, the people that make the decisions. And the question on my mind is Michelin coming to Texas. So I saw that Michelin's going to Atlanta. I think I saw that. I saw that they're going to Denver, but I live in Texas and yet no Michelin. There's a lot of rumors that Michelin is coming to Texas. And as I talk to some chefs, they're like, yeah, done deal. Other chefs are like, no, someone screwed it up and the deal's done. It's not going to happen. Other chefs are like, yeah, for sure. They're just waiting until the end of the year to announce it. But no one really knows. Everyone's kind of speculating right now. Well, you know, you should see these chef group texts that I'm in. What's up with Michelin? I don't know. What do you know? It's all this back and forth. There's a lot of speculation, a lot of rumors, but I don't think any of us really know what's going on. I hope Michelin comes to Texas. Long overdue, right? I don't know who will get a Michelin star. I'm sure I'm sure there's a lot of candidates in Austin and Dallas and Houston and San Antonio. But nonetheless, it's incentive for the chefs to work towards something and push themselves a little bit for those chefs that want to play that game, right? I'm hoping Michelin comes to Texas because they're in Atlanta, they're in Colorado, they're in Chicago, they're in California, they're in New York, they're in Miami. Texas seems like the obvious choice. The fact that they're not here, <laughs> that's almost disrespectful to Texas. Like, who did you guys piss off, right? Anyway, so why do I bring that up? Yeah, you know, people don't know, but I do a lot of consulting work. And I was talking to someone the other day, and we were talking about the potential of Michelin coming to Texas. And they said, if Michelin comes to Texas and you're consulting for us, could you get us a Michelin star? And I said, well, I have no idea. And the reason I say that is because a lot of people speculate on, oh yeah, of course I'd get a Michelin star. They think they'll get a Michelin star. But the truth of the matter is, until you've demonstrated that you could do that, it's just theory. This is something I talk about often. There's levels to this game. And I've never gotten a Michelin star. So how can I sit here and say that I could get one, right? It's in theory. I think I could, but I don't know if I could. I can't prove it. And anyone out there thinking that they could get one, 
it's just talk until they could prove it, right? In theory, I think I could. I look at food on the one star level and no disrespect to these places. I mean this in a good way. I look at these places that have one star and I think I could do that food. Nothing that I see is out of my comfort zone of technique. It's in my vocabulary when I look at most one star places. Like I look at that and I say, okay, restaurants that I've run as a chef are performing at about that level. When you get to the two star level, I would say there's a lot that I don't understand when I look at it. It's like, ah, I don't know how they did that. I have no idea what they did here and I have no idea what they did there. And I would have a hard time replicating certain things. I mean, for God's sake, look at Noma it was like two Michelin stars for a long time. I'm not peeling pumpkin seeds and searching for reindeer penises. I'm not doing that. So clearly when you get to the two star level, there's, it's very advanced cooking. And when you get to the three-star level, there's things that I don't even know. Like I was talking with one of my friends the other day, he's a three-star chef, and I was looking at some of the food that he did. And I was like, I have no idea how to reverse engineer that. Like, I, I have no idea how he did. I couldn't look at it like chefs a lot of times can look at dishes and say, I see it, I can reverse engineer it, I can make it. I know how to cook, I know how to do this, that, and the other. But every now and again, you see things and it's like, I just don't understand. It's above my reading level. And I think that's what people don't understand is like, there's so much detail, the higher up you go that some of it is so advanced. You don't even know that you're missing it. And that that's a weird thing to, to think about. Like some of the techniques that they do are so subtle and so advanced that they're over your head that you don't even know what happened. Right. We were talking about like all the peas have to be the right size. What's the difference? That pea was smaller than this pea. You know, maybe they put them through a grate or whatever to sort them out or whatever the case may be. The attention to detail, the further up you go, the ladder is tremendous. And I think sometimes people overestimate their abilities. So back to the person that I was talking to with consultancy, I said, I don't know if I can get you a Michelin star. I try, but it's just theory. In Texas, we don't have Michelin, so I've never had the opportunity to get one. I've gotten four stars from Forbes Travel Guide or a Zagat rating of 29 or, you know, local newspapers, the Dallas morning news or whatever the case may be, but that's not Michelin. And it's a different, it's a different level of expectation. Anyway, we're a long way off from kitchen etiquette. We'll, we'll get to that in a second. The other thing that you all should be looking at. So assuming that you're listening to this when it's released. So Sunday, September 3rd, today is the day that the Bocus Dior USA qualifier is going on. I'm clearly not there. I'm recording a podcast working, but I'm excited about that. So for those of you that don't know, the Bocuse Dior is a, a competition which takes place in Lyon, France. A bunch of countries start to compete. Right now, the USA qualifier is going on in Napa at Copia. And there's three competitors right now that are competing to represent the USA. Angus McIntosh, he's competitor number one. Vincenzo Lozetto, who's competitor number two. He's the uh, CDC at Press Restaurant. In Napa Valley works with Philip Tessier. I believe Philip Tessier is his coach. Philip Tessier, for those of you that don't know, is a silver, silver medal winner at the Bocuse Dior, the first American to ever get on the podium. Fantastic chef. And then you have Stephanie De Palma, who was formerly the CDC at Addison in Southern California, three Michelin star restaurant, extremely talented chef. All three chefs are extremely talented. I have no idea who's going to win. I'm very curious. I'm excited to see the platters and hear about the competition. I have a couple of friends that are there this week. I'm sure it'll be all over social media. Anyway, it'll be pretty cool to see who wins that. So you should be checking that out. The highest level technique that you're going to see a lot of times happens at these Bocuse Dior competitions. So if you're a technique geek or a technique junkie like I am, you want to check it out so you can see what's going on. They're always going to pull out some new stuff that you haven't seen before. So it's pretty cool. Most of these chefs that are competing are... Michelin three-star level, but they're the elite of the Michelin three-star level. You're the, they're the hand-picked ones from those kitchens. So it's pretty high level. Go check it out. So I put together a list of 10 basic etiquette things that people need to know about kitchens. And I, I want to, I might share a couple of stories along the way, but a lot of times new cooks come into the kitchen. They just don't know, or servers or other people that are working in the kitchen. They just don't understand these basic things that us as chefs know. But if you're new to the industry, you, you might make a big mistake. So listen to this episode, but 
maybe you need to share it with someone that's a little bit green that needs to hear some of the things that we're talking about. The first one is only cooks and chefs behind the line, right? It's busy, it's hot, pots and pans, tight space, knives, stress, chaos sometimes, depending on where you're working. Sometimes the floor is slippery. Could, there could be a grease spill. People could be moving with pots and pans and knives, whatever. It's a dangerous place. Nothing is more dangerous or infuriating than when someone who doesn't work behind the line unknowingly goes behind the line in the middle of the rush. The, the first time I ever saw that, I was like right out of culinary school and I was working in a kitchen and the server walked behind the line and like the sous chef was like, don't ever come behind my line and just laid into them. And I just remember I was like, oh shit. I didn't know that was a rule because I was still green, but I learned pretty quick. No one behind the line, but cooks and chefs. Now everyone's say, what about dishwashers and porters? And yeah, obviously the occasional person coming behind to refill plates or pick up dirty pots and pans, which by the way, stack your pots, stack your pans, make it easy for the dish station. But yes, they are going to come back on occasion, but for the most part during service, it should be cooks and chefs behind the line and they should have a certain flow. They're, you're always wanting to work at a certain cadence with the other people on the team to make sure that things are running smoothly and someone coming behind the line, it's dangerous for the person coming behind the line, but it's also dangerous for the rest of the team. It just breaks the rhythm when people are working, so don't do it. Anyway, only cooks and chefs behind the line. Number two, never touch another chef's knives without asking. Now, a lot of places have community knives, and I get that, right? A lot of times they have the community knives that they maybe they rent out or they purchase, and that's for people that don't have knives. That's a good thing. But a lot of times, chefs go and collect knives, and they collect very expensive knives, and they take great care of their knives, and it's like their samurai sword. Don't touch it, period. Don't even look at it. Pretend it doesn't exist. You're going to see some shiny new knives over there. Don't look at it. Don't touch it. Don't even think about it. Never touch another chef's knives without asking. And ask. Look, if someone came up to me and said, can I borrow your knife? I'd say, I'd be like, annoyed. don't you have a knife? Are you not ready for the job? This is a professional kitchen. You're going to show up without knives. Of course, things happen. Maybe they don't have a knife. Maybe they have, maybe they're a new cook and they couldn't afford it. That's different. But if you're a professional cook and you've been in this industry for a while and you're showing up to a job where everyone has knives and you don't have knives, it's just a lack of preparation and common sense. Like, of course things happen, but don't be that cook because that cook does exist. They show up and they want to borrow everyone's knife. But the worst thing is they take it without asking and you don't even know. And then maybe you have this thousand dollar Japanese knife and they drop it and they give it back to you with a big old chip in it. And you're like, uh, you ready to ring someone. I right? just talking about that. Just talking about that makes my blood boil. Don't be that person. Number three, use your kitchen voice. So we were talking about no one else behind the line other than cooks and chefs, but the cooks and chefs need to know how to operate on the line or in the kitchen. So it's hot corner behind knife, things like that. Use your voice. Do not whisper. I used to go up to cooks cause I would get so frustrated because they'd be like behind, you know, just kind of whispering. It's like, Say it loud. I'd rather you say it loud and me move than me not move and you stab me or you spill something on me. When you're coming around the corner, say corner so we don't collide. Teach this to the service team as well, right? You're going to prevent a ton of accidents simply by using your voice. It's completely acceptable to raise your voice if you're coming around the corner or if you're walking with a hot pot behind someone rather than spilling it on them. This has happened to me before. Like someone spilled hot boiling water on me once. Thank God I had an apron on. Everything still works. But another time, me being careless, talking about knife etiquette and also talking about using your voice, I was butchering a, a piece of meat and I had a very thin, flexible bony knife. So razor sharp, super thin bony knife. And I was sautéing at the same time that I was, I was multitasking, right? I was butchering something and I was sauteing and I didn't leave the knife on my station. So I took the knife with me over to the saute station and I was holding it uh, carelessly. And another cook came up behind me to see what I was doing. And as he walked up behind me to kind of peek over my shoulder, my knife slid right into his leg. And I could feel the whole thing. It, was, it felt kind of gross. And uh, he just made a face. I think he just stabbed my leg. So he, it was a thin bony knife, like I'm talking super thin and he just pulled it out. It probably went in like 
literally like two inches in his leg. But the dude was a gangster. All he did was just, you know, uh, that sucks, my fault. He wrapped it up with a, you know, bandana, tried to make a tourniquet or whatever, and then just went back to work. That's it, like nothing, like no big deal. Tough guys. It reminds me of another time, you know, speaking of knife safety, i digress for a second. I worked with this guy from El Salvador. And he was a dishwasher. He was like a gorilla in El Salvador. And I don't mean like the, I mean like the people with guns in the jungle those types of gorillas, probably a literal killer. Like, I, I don't know. He was a scary dude. Anyway, one of the servers put a broken wine glass on the dish station and didn't say anything. So he was a gangster and he was hustling on the dish station, working by himself. And he grabbed it and he sliced a big chunk of meat right through his palm and it was dangling and it was gross. And so they called me over to the dish station. The, the sous chef says, Hey, you need to go check this guy out. He's bleeding really bad. And I see him back there wrapping it up. And I said, let me take a look. And it's, I mean, it's a big chunk of flesh, like a V cut out of his palm. And it looks bad. And I said, you probably need to go to the ER. This guy had a lot of pride. Like I said, he was, he was a soldier. He's like, no, no, I'm good. I'm good. Let me just wrap it up. Maybe I'll put some Gorilla Glue on. I was like, no, you should probably go to the ER. He's like, no, 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 chef. I'm good. I'm good. I'll prove to you. Like he wanted to prove to me how tough he was. I was like, look. You need to take care of that. He's like, no, no, no. Just get me some scissors. I'm going to just cut this flesh out. <laughs> and yeah, that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to, cut the, he wanted to cut a big chunk of meat out of his hand with some Joyce Chan. I wouldn't do that. I would have gone to the ER. Anyway, no unsolicited help. And what I mean by that is sometimes you're caught up on your work and maybe you're working the line or you're working a station. Then you just jump in and you try to take over someone's project or you try and start helping them cook, don't do that. Because you could throw off their rhythm. They might have a certain way that they like to do things. They might have the tickets organized in their mind and you start messing with things on their station. Don't do that. In the kitchen, you don't give help unsolicited. You ask first. And I'm not saying don't help people. But unsolicited is one thing. You have to ask, do you want help? Because a lot of times they'll say, no, I just need this, this, this. Or a lot of times they'll tell you exactly what they need help with. Because a lot of times people want to help with things that they don't need help with. They might tell you, yeah, I need help. All I need you to do is set my plates out. I got the rest. But you're like over there basting their fish, messing up the rhythm. So when you need to give someone help because you see that they need help, it's important that you ask them first, do you need help? And if they say yes, say, what do you want me to do? But do not just jump in unsolicited because you could actually create a little bit more chaos than you were intending. So no good deed goes unpunished. This is one that I don't say often, but it's underlooked. I put a chef's PSA up on it once, and that is no hands on pockets. What do hands in pockets say, right? So if you're new to a kitchen, you shouldn't, or if you're working in hospitality, don't walk around with your hands in your pockets. Number one, that's gross. Like pockets are dirty, linty, money, phone, whatever is in your pocket. Whatever's in your pocket, nonetheless, is gross. Most likely, it's not sanitary. But two, your hands should be working. And if you're walking around with your hands in your pockets, that means you're not working. Get to work. When other people see people with their hands in their pockets, all it screams is, I'm not working. Right? Both hands out of your pockets doing something. Or keep them by your side. Maybe you're standing or whatever, right? Just keeping your hands in your pockets is a bad habit, especially if you work in hospitality. If you're working in the kitchen, no hands in pockets. Which leads to number six, cell phones. Cell phones are now like a part of doing business in the kitchens. When I was coming up, like, only the chef had a cell phone, really. You had a Blackberry, maybe. But now everyone has cell phones. So it's a part of the culture. So I know a lot of people take notes with their cell phones. A lot of people are taking photos with their cell phones for station diagrams or whatever. So I understand that the cell phone is going to be a part of it. But number one, don't put your cell phone on your cutting board. Where do you use your cell phone? Where are you scrolling on Instagram liking those chef's PSA posts, right? Are you sitting on the toilet looking at your phone? Don't be gross. Don't put your cell phone on your cutting board, right? You'd be on the toilet and then put the cell phone next to the onions and chop and say, oh, it's because I'm looking at the rest. Kind of gross. Don't put the cell phone on the cutting board. Wash your hands. While we're at it, don't put boxes on the cutting board. As a matter of fact, boxes shouldn't even be in the kitchen. So I get it. Not everyone's going to have the opportunity to transfer everything from a box to a camera and this, that, and the other. But in my opinion, boxes do not go in the kitchen or they definitely don't go on workplace surfaces. 
And the reason that is because people are like, why? Because boxes are stored in warehouses where there's rats and roaches and feces and rat shit and all sorts of other things. Like, and then you're going to pick that box up where it's stored on the floor and then put that on top of your cutting board. Or you're going to put that on a workplace counter. Cutting boards are sacred. Workspace counters are sacred. Boxes don't go on work surfaces, period. Don't be gross. So I had mentioned earlier that I did a leadership seminar in San Antonio. And one of the things that I always put in my seminars is shaken and shake out. I haven't done a chef's PSA on it. I've put it in the books. I've talked about it at length, but I haven't done a PSA on it on social because I'm not sure necessarily how to word it. So it's somewhat, <laughs> so it's somewhat interesting, but let me tell you what I think. I think that every kitchen should shake in and shake out. You shake in when you arrive with the team and you shake out when you leave. A lot of the best kitchens, this is a normal practice when you go to the high-end kitchens. The more professional kitchens are always going to shake in and shake out. It's something I learned early on from one of my first chefs. He'd always come in, whether it was handing, you know, whether it was payday, he'd shake your hand, thank you for the job and give you your paycheck. Or whenever he'd arrive, he'd walk around and shake everyone's hand. It was just professional courtesy and commonplace. But here's why I think it's important because a lot of times people have been in those awkward situations where someone lower on the totem pole is in a room with someone a little bit higher and they don't talk and there's this awkward silence. Maybe it's on the elevator. Or they're walking down the hall together and they don't even acknowledge each other. And a lot of places, believe it or not, you spend all day with people, but you don't even greet and acknowledge people. That culture then bleeds out into the service team, which then bleeds into the guest. Now, if you have a culture based on dignity and respect, the foundation is built with the common courtesy of acknowledgement and, and shaking hands and greeting one another. Now, that doesn't mean you need to get caught up with COVID and I don't want to shake hands. Okay, then fist bump or wave or something, but acknowledge each other. Acknowledge everyone when you arrive to work. Acknowledge everyone when you leave to work. Acknowledge everyone when you're leaving the line, pet peeve. If you're leaving the line, say offline, right? Don't just disappear. Uh, you might be new to line cooking. You never just vanish in the middle of service to go to the bathroom. You say offline and you ask permission or say, chef, may I, may I go offline? Whatever the case may be, you don't just vanish. But anyway, acknowledge in, acknowledge out. And the reason I say that is because you begin the day as a professional, you close the day as a professional, regardless of what happens in between. And a lot of shit happens in between during service. You might fight over whatever, right? But at least you know that you have a daily reset. And for that moment where you're acknowledging people, so you're shaking in and shaking out, it establishes equality amongst whoever is doing the shaking in and shaking out, whether it's the chef and the steward or the general manager and the server. It doesn't matter. In that moment, you're establishing equality. And establishing equality is very important to have a good workplace culture. In kitchens that I've run and people have left and they go to a place where there is no shake in and shake out culture. The one thing that they always tell me that they miss the most is that they're like, no one shakes in here and it bothers them. When you've worked in that environment, you start to become more courteous and more professional. And what's the downside of being a nicer person and being more professional and courteous and hospitable and having a better culture? There's no downside. There's only upside. Anyway, shake in and shake out. Another one, no sitting on workplace counters. So counters are for glasses, not for asses, right? Nothing's more annoying than after service. And then you see the culinary team or the service team just jump on workspace counters and just sit there and chit chat and talk. Like, Get your ass off the table. I remember the first time I did that. It was the end of service and I, I was sitting up there and my chef came around the corner. He's like, get your ass off the table. I was very embarrassed, but I never did it again. And obviously he explained to me why asses are not sanitary. Don't sit on the counter. It reminds me of an old iron chef episode where Bobby Flay jumped on the counter and stood on the cutting board. And then Morimoto was really pissed off. He's saying, Oh, he's not a chef. I don't remember how it went down, but I remember I was like, oh, Morimoto's pissed. You don't disrespect the cutting board. You don't disrespect worse workplace surfaces, right? Keep it professional. So wrapped up your shift. Don't sit on the counter. Number nine, no whistling in the kitchen. Now you do what you want, but I'm telling you, like there's a lot of chefs that are very superstitious. No whistling in the kitchen. It's considered bad luck. 
So if they if you see the chef whistling or see other people whistling, do it. But don't be the first one to try it out. If you're new in the kitchen, say, I'm just going to whistle me a Cardi B song over here. Whatever. I don't know if Cardi B songs are whistle ready. Anyway, you get the point. Don't whistle in the kitchen or do find out. Last one is clean as you go, right? Don't wipe things directly on the floor. Wipe it into a little container and then put it in the trash. If you see a piece of trash on the floor, don't walk past it without picking it up. Maybe keep a little sanitizer towel on the piano of your stove and you wipe it down on occasion. In between uses, wipe your board. Wipe your knife. As I say, happy knife, happy life. Keep it clean. Clean as you go is a very important skill, right? One of the things that I've noticed, like for me, when I see someone that's fast in the kitchen and clean, you know they're a good cook. Like they're high level. That to me is the sign of a high level cook. Someone that's fast, someone that's clean, and someone that's precise. But that clean part is very important. So you could be precise, but not fast and not clean. But if you have all three, unstoppable. Those are the top of the food chain cooks, the ones that can work fast, work clean, and be very efficient. Working clean is just being smart about how you organize your station, right? Minimizing the amount of steps that you have to pick up a dish, organizing things so that all the like things are together, not putting the wet ingredients in the ninth pan behind the dry ingredients. So every time you take it out, you're getting all the dry ingredients wet like you do, right? It makes no sense. You got to be smart about how you organize yourself. Work clean, wipe down. Anyway, you all get the point. I had some other ones that uh, I was going to talk about, but I didn't. One was this is like bonus. Bonus number 11. A lot of places, and I didn't talk about this because I don't necessarily believe it. And I haven't worked in a place in a long time that has talked about this. So I don't even know if it's relevant. But a lot of places would say, don't kill lobsters prior to service starting because it's bad luck. You know, anyway, I, I don't know if that's still a thing, but that used to be a thing back in the old days, but I haven't heard it in a while. So I'm not even going to talk about that. But anyway, I would have said no radios in the kitchen, but I didn't want everyone coming at me saying, how dare you not have radios in the kitchen? And I've changed my stance on that because before I would be like no radios in the kitchen. But now if you're listening to chef's PSA podcast in the kitchen, that's acceptable. In my opinion, like you get a pass radios in the kitchen. If you're listening to this podcast, if you want to support the show, you know what to do. Make sure you leave five stars. If you listen on Spotify, hit the subscribe button. If you're on YouTube, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. There's a donation button. If you want to support the show, there's different tiers. I appreciate the support. It goes a long way to bring you this wonderful information. Of course, go to chefspsa.com. You can get all the books there. You can go to the merch, as I mentioned, 10% off right now at the Chef's PSA merch store. And be on the lookout for the Manage Like an Executive Chef episodes as they come out. I'll be releasing them kind of sporadically as I get them done, as I'm working on the translation and the food cost guide. So I got a lot of things that I'm working on. Stay tuned. Anyway, thank you all very much. See you next week. Hit the porno music. 